This is Shante for the Game Boy Color. So, my opinion of this game is really mixed. Uh, I think a quick summary is that the things that are good in this game are really, really, really good. And the things that are bad in this game are bad enough that they kind of drive me crazy. <laughs> like, make me not want to pl play it enough that... Uh, I ended up selling my copy that I bought. So this game came out in 2002, and way back then, did I have the internet back then? Yeah, the internet was pretty, yeah, the internet was common back then. So internet and video game magazines, learning about this game, I could tell even before it came out that it was gonna be something special. Uh, and I bought it when it was in, in stores. And uh, yeah, they were right. This game is, uh, I don't think there's any other Game Boy game like it. I did end up, uh, even though, you know, I got it in 2002, I ended up selling my copy about eight years later, I think. Because, uh, well, for a few different reasons. So right off the bat, this game, uh, it starts with a really clever opening opening stage, opening level. Uh, you know, I've got the, the pirate ship in the background shooting shooting cannonballs into the foreground. It's such a clever idea, but even here, like the uh, the graphics, you can see where the graphics, uh, incredible graphics, start to work against the gameplay. Where I mean, the cannonballs are blasting the the bridge apart in places, but yet it leaves these ropes, which makes sense because it holds the bridge together. But then uh, it makes it a little tricky to tell where you can stand and where you can't stand, and uh, that kind of becomes. So, and the the idea of uh, knowing what you can have collision with and what the player character does not have collision with uh, becomes a problem, especially later, a little later in the game. It becomes it kind of becomes a uh, a matter of trial and error. Oh, here we get introduced to uh, the antagonist in the game. <laughs> the, this the the uh, lady pirate, Risky Boots. I love Risky Boots as a character. Her and her sword there. So she's got it. You can't see it in the little Game Boy spray, but her character design, her, uh, is really clever. Her, her, her clothing top is like the upper part of a skull, like a human skull, and the bottom part of the skull is made up by her, uh, like the waistband and on her, on her, on her pants. And it's a really cool design. And I love the name Risky Boots. Uh, all the writing in this game is really, really fun. There's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue in the game and a lot of characters and they're all really fun. Let's see. So after getting through a little intro bridge area, this is the first real like uh, intro stage where you're running through the town that's being attacked by the pirates. And okay, so I briefly mentioned the graphics in this game. So starting with uh, Shantae the sprite. She has an incredible number of frames of animation. I can't even count them all just by looking at it. I mean, normal Game Boy games will have two. Two frames of animation. Uh, a real fancy one will have three, like uh, Super Mario Brothers games or Metroid 2. This game, that walk cycle is gorgeous, and that's just walking. Her attack animation has so many frames of animation. And it makes it all just buttery smooth to look at. And the enemies as well. Uh, a lot of later enemies, well, I guess every enemy in the game, is just animated really nicely. We've got big sprites, which are big and colorful, which is an achievement of its own. Because the Game Boy can only, the Game Boy can only manage, uh, like like many 8-bit consoles, the NES and the Game Boy can only have sprites. Sprites can only have three colors in them, plus one transparent. So the fact that she has skin tone, clothing colors, uh, eye color hair color, hair tie color, and uh, is that it? Plus the black outline, that's six colors. Really well designed, well designed sprites. So the city just got attacked even more, and it's now on fire, and you get to see one of the, for the one of the first times in the game, I think the first time in the game, where you get to see a special effect with lighting. The developers of this game, WayForward Technologies, implemented, uh, what is it? Color, 
so when lighting, they implemented lighting in a Game Boy Color game. So the city's on fire, and it, it's not just on fire; it's like pulsating, and the city changes colors. The characters, like uh, their palette, is changed. It, it's so good. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen this. Uh, I don't remember seeing. This. I'll have to look for it in other Game Boy games. Um, yeah. And uh, there's this really cool effect later on in the game. Uh, even when walking in between beams of light that are like filtering through a window, you can see the color change. And the color just changed again. This is like a third color palette where uh, it's now nighttime as she's going through the city. <sighs> you got a running animation, her animation. Oh, I don't, I don't think I've ducked yet. The uh, crouching animation when you press the the down key, she crouches down and does a little butt wiggle. Oh, this part's so clever. So you've got the pirates trying to break into a door, which, you know, they're in the background, you can't do anything. But every time they smash the wall trying to break in with their little uh, ramming, ramming beam thing, it knocks these bricks in and out. <laughs> it's such a cool idea for a uh, level design, for a little, little puzzle level design. You see the city on up in smoke in the background. Yeah, this whole game is just so much attention to details. Oh, here's another instance where uh, things in the background affect things in the foreground. That cannon shooting at you. And so many of it is just one, one off little things. Like, I don't even think you see those, uh, those, uh, those cannons again in the game. Not that I remember. So here we've got a uh, great example of show, don't tell. Where, uh, you see the pirates. <laughs> see the Tinkerbat pirates, uh, stealing what they came for. More characters are introduced. Got the local scientist. Introduces the story of the game. What is it? So, uh, uh, the, the pirate Risky Boots uh, stole a steam engine, and uh, which she's going to use. You know, steam engines. If nobody else has a steam engine, then uh, that's a lot of power right there. And so she's going to. I think there's four dungeons in the game, plus like a final level. And each of the four dungeons holds a mythical item that helps with a steam engine. Like for example, the only one I remember is that the first one is uh, like it produces infinite hot water. If you have infinite water, you have infinite steam to power a steam engine sort of thing. So yeah, the plot is a plot is a cool idea. Uh, the story plays out, <laughs> the story is great, with all the different characters and the way your adventure goes through different cities and throughout this world. It's one giant world. It's, uh, it's not a Metroidvania, but it is one giant world. Is it? No, I don't think it's a Metroidvania. You don't, you don't get items to go, well, it might be a Metroidvania. Because the way you unlock different areas, one of the ways you unlock different areas is to get new, uh, new power-ups. No, they're not power-ups, they're, uh... Animal transformations. There are a ton of different animal transformations, and uh, we'll see one of those later. Oh, the first boss fight, where you meet up with Risky Boots. <laughs> That's far enough, Risky. Oh man. And just like the rest of this game, the boss fights are original and clever. A lot of it. Uh, a lot of this game. Oh man. So. Yeah, a lot of this game is, uh, once again, it's a lot of, uh, it, it's super polished. It's just everything in this game is so well polished. Uh, some of, almost to the point where it's a detriment to the gameplay. Um, for example, this boss fight is so cool, so cute, and uh, it's, it looks amazing. But once you figure out what to do, it's mm, almost boring. So we've got a uh, little guy up here loading cannonballs. Dodge the cannonballs. Yeah, dodge the cannonballs. Yeah, good job. And then, uh, did I eventually figure this out? Yeah, you just gotta, you just gotta blast the uh, the powder keg in the bottom there. So I might as well talk about the uh, one of the first problems I have in this game is. Uh, 
the way... Uh, oh, well, first of all, the collision... The collision detection is a little... What's the opposite of generous? <laughs> it's a little... I think it's a little touchy. I remember lots of times getting hit by things and feeling... What the crap? I didn't get hit. That's not... Uh, that wasn't my fault. Uh, as for the attacks... Um, the hair whip looks really cool, and it's such a great idea for a character. But the, uh, the you know, the first problem... Oh, yeah! Oh, do a little butt wiggle. Is this it? The first problem is... Uh, <laughs> is uh, by having her hair be the attack, a lot of the enemies in the game are... Are, are like on the ground or lower which means a lot of the times when I'm attacking it's you know run 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 crouch attack crouch attack run 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 crouch attack crouch attack and it gets uh, having to crouch so many times is tedious <laughs> Sploosh. that's cool uh, can be tedious um, this is a really cool uh, battle idea hit him before he drops the basket. This is really fun. This is a really great idea. How did they do this? So they've got the ship going up and down in the background. That's Game Boy layer. That's the background layer. Oops, died. So the ship going up and down in the background, uh, in the background is the background layer. The bottom window is the window layer. You know, with all the health stats. And I think everything else is a sprite. The, pil the p pillars, the piers, the whatever. The pillars of wood in the in the water down there in the bottom are the are sprites. Shante, of course, is a sprite, and the characters are sprites. That's a lot of sprites on screen. Game Boy can handle up to forty, I believe. Yeah, but it's just the uh, oh, and the doors. The doors opening up would be sprites. Really well done. Um, so in addition to many uh, your hair whipping high and many of the enemies being down low, which means you have to cr cr uh, crouch a bunch of times to attack, it just gets kind of tedious. Also, the hair whip has this uh, delay in the attack. Right, the hair whip has a delay in its attack, which uh, I never quite got used to. All right, so here's the first real level in the game. This is when the game really starts. This is where we'll, you'll be for the next, uh, for the rest of the game. And uh, this is where I usually, this is where I usually uh, get turned off from the game, where I start getting it, where, where I really start feeling like the game is unfair. Which the game might not be unfair, but for the player to feel that in the first, oh my gosh, I'm already dead. This is, this is like level one. Um, for the player to feel that right at the beginning of the game it makes it really... it's hard. Hard for me to get invested. So... Um, right, so I, I mean, anytime I pick up this game I always you know play through the intro level and I'm like, man this is amazing! Why do I ever... why do I ever not play this? Or why did I ever think this wasn't good? And then I get here and just get my butt kicked. Um, so we've got these guys randomly popping up out of the ground. Uh, we've got these <laughs> scarecrows randomly uh, popping out of the cornfields in the background. And once again, this is so good! I love these characters, I love the animation, but it just kind of gets put together in a way that makes it not fun. Uh, and I kind of, I know why this is done the way it is. Uh, if they weren't programmed with this AI, I, I think it'd be, it'd be too easy to just just run. Hold the B button and run through this whole section and not encounter anybody. Just run past everyone. And so I assume the developers made the change or made, designed it the way it is so you can't do that. Like this guy, he's already there attacking by the time you walk in. If you were trying to run past him, you'd get you'd get hit. Which is good. Good game design. Get, you know, avoid that. But, oh man, right there. He just popped out of the ground in front of me and nailed me. It, so much of it feels cheap. Uh, cheap hit, hurt. Error hits. Cheap attacks. 
and uh, yeah, it turns me off. So the delay in the hair whip, I don't know. I I kind of start getting used to it the more I play it, but uh, I do get used to the delay in the hair whip the more I play it. Um, but still, it feels uh, I don't. It never really feels. N never really felt natural. Which is odd because one of my very favorite games of all time is The Legend of Zelda 2, The Adventures of Link. Or Zelda 2, The Adventures of Link, whatever the name is. And. Um. Which also has a delay in attack. I think this one is just long enough. I think. I think the delay is long enough. And, uh. Oh, also you lose control while doing the attack. I just realized that. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> hey, Shante. You can you lose control when doing the hair whip attack. So I think is one thing that makes it makes the attack feel a little stickier. Like you can't uh, once you're attacking, you're vulnerable to be hit. So you better start doing it when you need to. Otherwise, if you you know you make a mistake before you attack, then you're gonna get hurt. This part especially, this woods section, wooded area, really frustrated me. Oh, I didn't mention, so we just saw, so it's nighttime now. In the overworld, there is a day and night mechanic, which is another thing that makes this really cool. It changes the music, it changes the entire color palette, including the characters. Super impressive. Um, whee! But yeah, this wooded area. So this might... Well, no, we'll save that for next section. So the attack is, uh, it looks really good, but it's a little clunky to use. It's just clunky enough that it makes me frustrated. <laughs> so once again, this is uh, in Metroidvania fashion. There's sections of this game that you see, but you can't access until you get a power up or ability later on. And you can come back here and and check it out and get the, you know find out what's there. This whole yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this game, uh, the power ups in this game are animal transformations. Throughout the game, you get animal transformations that uh, allow you to use different abilities. For example, there's an elephant that could ram into things. Uh, and the way you transform is to, uh, you do these uh, little magical dances. Kind of kind of like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Play different music to uh, to do different, do different things. In this game, you... This game, you do different uh, dance moves to transform into different different animals. Okay, so this part of, I can usually ah, oh, yeah. This is this is the area where I usually really become uninvested. Where So we've got endlessly spawning little snakes there. We've got uh, that fish statue looking thing that pops out in waterfalls and just attack you. Uh, so we've got enemies that well, pop in onto the screen that, uh, yeah, oh, that, uh, really hard, you know, it's hard to dodge, almost impossible to dodge. Uh, another problem right here, this is a prime example of where the incredible, really, really beautiful graphics work against the gameplay to know what you can and what you can't stand on. So those bushes there, that the trees that stick out of the the side of the cliff. You can stand on those. The... Oh, yeah. The, um... And there's these other, uh, these other rocky platforms that really, really look like, you know, bridges. They're just part of the background. You cannot stand on those. Uh, are just two quick examples. I can walk through these... These, uh... That's, oh my gosh, I really, just even just watching the video, I thought I was going to fall down right there, but I landed on the tree. You can walk through some of the, uh, the stone, uh, stone walls. Uh, you can't walk through other stone walls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
in the developer's defense, though, I did realize I, I died here. I cut it out, uh, but I died in this section to because uh, I couldn't see where I was going, and and uh, I just cut that part out. But uh, I realized after playing through that section again, in the developer's defense, that I was uh, they do. If you can't, almost every place you can stand, if you just stop and look at the screen, you can see another platform below you that you are able to stand on, and uh, which is good. And, and if the and if you can't see something, then just pretty much go straight down and you'll be safe. Because uh, before that, I was just blindly jumping and it was miserable. I you know I fell into a bottomless pit. Uh, but yeah. But even being able to see below you, I st it still took me a while to learn what the developers decided w did have collision detection and didn't have collision detection. What I could stand on and what I couldn't stand on. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really good, but at the same time kind of frustrating. Which is kind of the theme of, theme of this game. So this is the first, uh, this is the first town. I made it to the first town. They've got shops. They've got, uh... Oh, <laughs> the start menu. Hey, muffins! I think one of the things uh, that I should have been doing when playing this game back in the day, I should have been buying more items, buying more, uh... <sighs> Yeah, buying more items that, you know, to help me in difficult sections. I think that would have made the game easier. Often, when I play, I'm one of those people. I'm too stingy in video games. Like, I won't, I'll collect money but not spend it. When I do get items, I won't use them because I might need them later. Later, Yeah, this is, I don't think, this is not this kind of game. Uh, I did eventually, so, so after I sold my cartridge, and I did, uh, I wanted to give the game a, a fair shot, so I loaded up in an emulator around, I don't know, 2015, and did play through the entire game, uh, and I was absolutely amazed. I was so impressed with the, the entire game, right up to the final boss. The final boss just blew me away of how, how clever it was, how cool it was. Um, it's just everything is so polished. I just wish these little little tiny things didn't uh, pull me pull me away from the game. Uh, and it was good. So, so even though I did have a good exp a good time playing through the entire game and was incredibly impressed by how good it was, I did uh, you know if I didn't have save states, I think I would have gone insane with all of the what I consider cheap shots. All the cheap hits in this game. <laughs> Refill health. Gosh, even just the sitting characters have three frames of animation. It's so good. Oh yeah, go see the statue guy again. Um, So the whole game takes place, uh, there's there's one large overworld, since it's a 2D side-scroller, the overworld, uh, it loops, if you go far enough to the right, eventually you'll end up, you know, coming in on the left of this giant overworld. Uh, so, which uh, is a cool idea, it really makes, you know, one big cohesive world, but here again is another one of the early problems in the game. I just talked to the character I needed to talk to in that town. Uh, the guy, uh, Bolo, I think his name is. <laughs> He's kind of funny, but anyway. Um, and he says, okay, I'll meet you. I'll meet you over at the, uh, at the entrance to the, to the, uh, the dungeon you need to go to, where, where I sent Risky Boots. And I'm thinking, oh no, yeah, I, I have to go back? I have to go back through that section I just slogged my way through? No. <laughs> I don't wanna. So I'm already I'm already replaying sections that I already didn't like playing through the first time. Oh, another thing, that jump right there. So the the standard jump in this game kind of has a low arc, which can make uh, 
make jump, you know, all the, all the platforming in this game to be tr tricky. You can't, uh, you can't make a lot of the jumps unless you're running. And so, I mean, since I entered this section again, I've been holding down the B button, holding down the run button almost like 99% of the time. And, uh, I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of exhausting having to <laughs> hold the run button hold hold the button while you're trying to press another button the entire time so another clever thing that the developers did was they added uh, these little these little warp sections oh my gosh look at the background this game has parallax scrolling I am a sucker for parallax scrolling I love it it's my favorite visual effect in any video game oh it's so good and there's a there's a yeah this game puts it to good use. All right, where was I? Sorry, I got distracted by the beautiful graphics. Uh, oh, the warps. So that just gave me a little warp back to this uh, this other section. Uh, the developers, the level designers, put in a lot of little warps. So the game feels feels huge. The world feels huge, and getting through it is kind of a kind of a slog until you start finding all these uh, these little warps, these little uh, shortcuts, and there's quite a few of them. And it really, uh, I don't know, tightens up the uh, the game world. I don't even know where I am right now. Is this the same section? I don't know. Um, let's see. So we talked about the graphics, all the colors, the animations, the parallax scrolling. Uh, I think this might be this might be the largest Game Boy Color game ever officially released. Like it is, I'm sorry, largest uh, in in megabits, uh, the size of the cartridge. Uh, if it's not the biggest, then it's definitely one of the biggest. Um, yeah. Oh, the music. I haven't talked about the music yet. <sighs> like the graphics the music is really high quality which is great um, it was made with the, it's funny so it was made with the I almost instantly <laughs> I recognized it I recognize this music it's music made with the Paragon 5 Game Boy tracker software you know back from the early 2000s and I don't know I think it was a it was an internet article I read I'll never forget it it, uh, talking about this new Game Boy software, uh, music tracker software, music creation software for the Game Boy, that someone posted it online uh, and posted a, a, a demo online. Oh my gosh, listen to this music. I can't believe this is coming out of Game Boy. And I loaded it up and played it and thought to myself, this? This, I, I really, really didn't do it for me. Um, and I recognize that in this game, it has a distinct, uh, I don't know if it's the software or the way people program for it, you know, write the music in it. Uh, it it's this uh, warbly sound, I would describe it. And uh, I don't know, I guess I like my nice solid sine waves and, and classic uh, chiptune music. Uh, so it's the, I don't know, I call it the instruments. The instrument sounds that are used in addition to uh, the music style, kind of piratey, piratey, uh, fantasy themed sort of thing, genie themed, or uh, it just doesn't do it for me. So, in summary, the music is really, really good and really high quality, but I don't like it. It's kind of like the whole game. Oh gosh, more parallax scrolling. So this is the first dungeon area. So here's look at this. Here's one of the first one of the another problem. You see this water down below? That's that's a bottomless pit. If if you fall in it, like it's instant death. I went down to get that heart, you know, stand on that black ledge, and why now suddenly I'm dead. <sighs> so that's bad, but oh my gosh, look at the graphics on the uh, the the water the the uh, pillars that are underwater the way uh, they uh, move with the refraction <laughs> it's so good ah everything in this game is just so good or so bad <sighs> so 
So yeah, this is the first dungeon. And uh, they do... Uh, how? They do this... Uh, there's uh, some really fun, really cool puzzles in here. So the puzzles... When I... So, you know, I'd walk into a new room, kind of figure out what was going on. Okay, I need a key. Where's the key? Oh, I see where it is. How do I unlock it? Okay. And uh, really, really a nice... Oh my gosh, even stepping into the shadows just at the edge of the room. Oh, it's so good. Wow. Um, wow. What was I talking about? Oh, keys. So, you see a puzzle and figuring it out. It was really good. Really fun. Really neat. Pretty original puzzles. Was this a little, little special character to fight? Oh yeah, the water boss. So much animation. It looks so cool. Um, but at the same time, the puzzles. There were things about them that just uh, made them so tedious. Like I'd figure something out. Oh, this is the uh, this is the room with the the sunbeams. You walk in and out of the sunbeams, and oh, so nice. The lighting changes as you walk in and out of the sunbeams. Uh, the puzzles are uh, the puzzles are really good, but there are things about them. Like I'd figure out what I what I need to do. Actually, there was one puzzle I never figured out. Like I solved it, but I don't know how I solved it. Whatever. Um, there's another room where once I figured out the puzzle, I realized <laughs> I realized oh crap! Now I gotta go all the way back. You're just more more backtracking. Uh, another room, I figured out the puzzle, and then immediately fell into a like a pit into another room because I couldn't read the environment. <laughs> so that was frustrating. So yeah, outstanding world, outstanding uh, dungeon design overall, but little things about it make it really frustrating. So another reason this game isn't too, uh, I don't know, I ended up selling my, I bought it in 2002, I sold my copy around 2010, I think, 2009, and uh, one of the reasons I decided, well, I've already mentioned lots of reasons why I sold it, why uh, there's so much good, but a lot of the uh, the, the little things uh, just really took me out of the game, made me not want to continue playing. And uh, when I was selling some games back around 2010, I realized, wow, I never play this game. So I ended up selling it. I mean, I don't even think, back when I had it, I think, I don't even think I made it. Uh, I don't remember getting through this dungeon. I don't even remember. I didn't. Even, I didn't even. I don't remember realizing that there even were dungeons in the game. Like I don't even know if I got this far. I might have beat the first dungeon, but definitely not the second. Um. Oh gosh, <laughs> here we go. So I see this random, random background. So then I drop down in this pit and I'm like, oh, oh, seriously? Uh, I gotta go. I'll do all that platforming again. Once I realized what the game wanted me to do. So yeah, it's clever, but holy moly. Now I gotta replay this section again. Anyway, it was stressful the first time. I didn't want to fall in the bottomless pits. What would I do differently? I don't know. Like, it's not hard. It's not hard. This section isn't hard. But if I make a mistake, I fall into a bottomless pit, which is a little stressful. And I have to do it at least twice because I didn't realize what I was supposed to do the first time. It just kind of all builds up. Um, but anyway, uh, 2010. Um, right, so the Game Boy. The original gray chonky brick Game Boy, DMG-01, was my childhood. I think I bought it when I was 10 years old. I saved up my money for most of a year and bought it, the original Game Boy, when I was 10 years old. And for the rest of, for years and years after that, the Game Boy, I mean, all I ever bought, I'd save up my money and buy new Game Boy games. I would spend all my, my free time, my hobby was playing the games. I would, uh, like, design little, little games to play. 
on paper and in my head. You know, hope someday in hopes that I could uh, I could program them for the Game Boy. The Game Boy was my childhood. It was my life. Uh, we, and I still hold a ton of nostalgia for it, which is why you know one of the reasons I make these videos so I can talk about, <laughs> I can ramble on and on about old video games. Uh, but this game is not nostalgic for me. By 2002, sure, I was still buying the new Game Boy games. I was, you know, I bought the Game Boy Color the day it came out. I bought the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP. But uh, by the time this game came out, I was... <laughs> 2002, I was... Uh, I mean, when this game came out, the Game Boy Advance had already come out. The next console after it. Also, uh, I was in my final year of college. I mean, the original Game Boy was... Um, saving up my allowance, asking my parents to drive me to the video game store, and uh, going to pick up the new game I wanted. You know, it, it's not really important, but it was it's important to me. It's nostalgic. Uh, when this game came out, I was in my last year of college. I got in my car and drove to the store. <laughs> Whatever. And picked it up. I was probably, what was I, last year of college? It's like 23 years old. <laughs> Oh yeah, 2002, 23. So it wouldn't didn't have a special special place in my heart or anything. <sighs> I do. Ooh, that's clever. See, that's really good. Watching that enemy walk into the wall. So you can see that there's a uh, secret over there. Oh, that's so good. Yep, warp squid. Um, what was I saying? Nostalgia. Um, so, on the one hand, I regret selling my cartridge because, you know, nowadays as an adult game collector, it would be really neat to have. On the other hand, if I did have it, I, I wouldn't play it. Um, I wouldn't sell it because, you know, it'd be a collector's item. Uh, the, uh, I mean, when I sold it, I didn't just sell it just because I was saving up for a, uh, a really nice keyboard for my computer, and that was, I think over 12 years ago, I bought that keyboard, and <laughs> I still use it every single day for anything on my computer, any games I play. My son uses it. <laughs> it's a really good keyboard. And it still works like the day I got it. So it's been good. I don't know. But yeah, so I don't know. When trying to decide whether or not uh, how I feel about selling the cartridge, I think ultimately it was fine. It would have been nice to have. It'd be a neat little, uh, I don't know, breaking piece. But yeah, ultimately it doesn't matter. It's not nostalgic for me. I wouldn't use it, and I would never sell it, so whatever. Oh, here's the part where... Uh... <laughs> so you rescue these genies inside the dungeons, and uh, they're the ones that teach you the different, uh, different transformation dances. And once again, an excellent uh, show, don't tell. Um, you know, the video game story progression. Oh, there's so many. Something, I don't know, Pokemon, Sword and Shield could have, uh, you know, take, learned a lesson from. Let's see here. Hey, and then there's tons of animations for the monkey. Cute. Whee! Let's see, I finally made this the first boss fight. So in making this video, I just played through the first, uh, I just played through the first dungeon. Kind of get a feel of the game. 
I'll remind myself what was in this game. I like how, so, yep, another show, don't tell. They got the show the story. Uh, Risky Boots tries to steal the, uh, the magical artifact and gets uh, thrown out of the dungeon. So I like that they show these monkeys. Uh, in typical Zelda fashion, the item that you get, or the ability you get in the dungeon gets used in the boss fight, at least right here. <laughs> oh, what a clever design. How did they do this? Oh, hold on, I'll think about it a minute. So in this part, you're supposed to, uh, I guess you're supposed to turn into a monkey, and the monkey can climb on walls, and so you grab onto the side of the screen. <laughs> uh, again, not really telegraphed, but grab it on the side of the screen and climb up so you don't get hit by the, uh, downed in the water. All right, how did they do this? So... Once again, this, so the, the second window, window two, background two is the, uh, the uh, health stats at the bottom. That doesn't change. Yeah. Monkey mode. Oh, I screwed it up. Crap. I think I do it once correctly. <laughs> so we've got in the, in the background. How do they do it? Yeah, I'm not really sure. So I think the the whole boss himself is the background? Ah, yeah, I don't know. That looks like too many sprites on screen. Oh, well, I like trying to figure these things out. They did... <laughs> the developers of this game did incredible animation, incredible programming, really good programming, really good level design. It's just the music, the uh, the lighting, the sound effects, the abilities, the uh, the puzzles, the items, the characters, the writing, it's all so good. But it all comes together in a way that, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it just, uh, it, too much of it uh, took me out of the game. Maybe not want to play it. Whee! So cool. 